Hello and welcome to the second session of our Biomedical Engineering Workshop by SimScale. It's great to see so many of you here again in the second session and before we actually start to discuss our today's topic I would like to make sure that the audio is working for everyone fine. So guys, please, you know it. There is a button in the software we are using for providing this webinar where you can virtually raise your hand. In the case you can hear me loud and clearly, please press this uh, raise your hand button. Great, I already see some hands, so uh, everything seems to work. In the case, for some reasons, uh, uh, maybe the audio quality should should become worse during this webinar, you can also use our um, toll-free audio service numbers to dial into the audio stream of the session. And for this, you only have to dial one of the numbers you can see here on the, on the slides and enter the access code you can see above. And this will allow you to, to also to listen to the audio of this webinar without your computer in the case you need it. Great, today uh, we will talk about stands, how they are designed and how simulation can help to improve them. And um, before we actually start to, to talk about this very interesting uh, topic, uh, we, I would just like to, to uh, talk again for so some minutes about the idea of this webinar since we have a lot of people who joined uh, uh, the workshop session uh, uh, today the first time. After that we will talk about stands and how we can use engineering simulation to optimize stands. Well, um, let's make it crisp about this webinar. Um, to put it in a nutshell, the idea of this uh, workshop series is to um, provide interested engineers uh, from the field of biomedical engineering to, to simulation. We really want to show you some uh, very hands-on uh, workflows you can use to create simulations yourself for biomedical devices. And um, therefore, this workshop is really focused on how to apply simulation engineering to biomedical um, applications. Therefore, we will not focus so much about fundamentals of simulation theory, but if you're interested in that, uh, we have a lot of other great resources you can use. And uh, uh, something which is also very important, you are not only asked to join this session, but you want you to become a contributor to, to, to SimScale. So the idea is that uh, we have, as you know, three live webinars. This is the second one. And after every webinar, you will get our optional homework assignment, which is about creating a simulation yourself with SimScale. And by um, submitting this homework and share it with us, you can qualify for a free professional training and the certification uh, uh, that you participated in this workshop series. And um, I don't want to talk about all the questions we were asked in the past, but only about uh, them which are very important. So we will record all these uh, webinars. The webinar from last week is already available on our website and on our YouTube channel. And uh, so in the case you, you missed one of the webinars, you can just watch it uh, at home whenever you want. And if you have any problems uh, with your homework, uh, we have also created a dedicated forum section, our SimScale forum, um, where you will get um, immediately help. Great. Then I think uh, everybody know everybody now knows uh, what what is the idea of this workshop series. And right now, I would like to to talk about stands and. Um, as you know, um, the session today is about not only what stands are, but how a simulation can help to improve them. And before we actually start to, do, to talk about what stands are, I would just like to talk about some fundamentals, I think, which are very important here. Um, and first of all, uh, you may know um, there are some, some diseases which are called cardiovascular diseases. And all these diseases, in the end, are about your your uh, the system in your body, which is transferring blood and and oxygen to to your organs. And um, these cardiovascular diseases, they can there are a lot of diseases which are which are of this type. But in the end, all of them together are really the main cause of death in the world. 
And especially when it comes to cardiovascular diseases, it's a lot, really a hassle for the patients because you have chronic pains and it can really reduce your lifetime and limit also your capacities. And only in Germany we have like 430,000 people who are suffering under cardiovascular diseases. And most of these diseases uh, um, are based on a so-called arteriosclerosis, which in the end is a narrowing of blood vessels because of deposition. And now let's just take a talk, take a look at such a blood vessel to see what this exactly means. On the left side here, you can uh, let's see a healthy blood vessel. You have these different layers, cell layers, and here you have the blood flowing, and here is like really the, the vessel wall. And when it comes to uh, arteriosclerosis, what basically is happening is that this uh, a vessel wall in the uh, it starts to storage cholesterol and blood components into the cells here. And here you can see this, so this should be uh, what we uh, uh, cholesterol here. And the problem is that it increases the thickness of the vessel wall because you have something inside, which you can see here. So if we take a, let me take my pen, and here we have uh, these depositions, and then we have the thick wall here. And what's happening then? You, uh, as you know, in our blood, we have special kind of uh, scavenger cells, so-called macrophages. They are like eating in the end things which are in your blood, in your body, which are not necessary or which are somehow dangerous for you. And the problem is that these macrophag cells. Uh, they now go into the vessel wall here. You can see then this, this small things are this macrophax, and they start to convert the vessel wall into plaque, which is what you can see here. And this plaque is really a, a hard layer. You can, it's, you can, it's just like a calcification, for example, of a of a of a tube of or of a of a um, water bath. They have a, a similar effect. And this, in the end, what is happening, this massively reduces the cross-section of your blood vessel and therefore uh, uh, has a bad impact on the perfusion of your body with blood and fresh oxygen, therefore. And there are a lot of risk factors which can, uh, which can increase the risk of, of getting such an arterial sclerosis. For example, high blood pressure, smoking, uh, unhealthy food, etc. And um, this is really a big problem. A lot of people are suffering under this disease. And it's very important to, to solve it because if, if, you don't, uh, if you don't use any therapy, this, this plaque will become uh, thicker and thicker and in the end uh, uh, what can happen finally is that you die because the blood cannot flow through your body. And basically, I mean, this is a big problem and for sure a uh, medical sign is caring for it for a long, uh, for a long time. And there are, uh, uh, let's say, two basic ways of therapy. And both of them are based in the end of increasing again the diameter of the vessel. And one, like uh, uh, in the past, what what's mainly done is to use a so-called balloon catheter, which was pushed into the to the vessel, expanded there, and then with that uh, removed the plaque. But for some reason, this is not really helping. And you need a permanent help um, to keep the, the blood vessel open. And for this, there is something which is called stand, and they can really help. So basically, what is a stand? On the left side here, you can see the stand. And in the end, it's like a mesh-like uh, device made of metal in most of the cases. And um, the way it's working is that you putting this into your vessel, then you inflate the stand, like you can see here. So this one is already inflated. This is in the lower one is in, in initial uh, uh, state. And by inflating the stand, this uh, uh, a mesh-like structure um, will uh, support in keeping the vessel open. And for example, for uh, the cardiovascular system, 
Um, this kinds of stands are used for a lot of applications, uh, for example, um, for the um, uh, ephemeral arterials, for heart arterials, for the renal, for coronary, but there are also applications which are non-arterial, for example, in the branches um, or the Bible duct. And there are basically two types of stands. Uh, first type, which we will focus on today, is so-called bar metal stands. This is just like, say, uh, this mesh-like device, which helps to support the, uh, the vessel. And there are also so-called drug allotting stands, which are, um, have a coating with, with a drug, for example, which is additionally helping to treat the disease. Because sometimes, uh, we will talk about it later, uh, uh, just removing the plaque is not helping in the long term because there is some reason why this plaque is generated and then you also need maybe a, a medical therapy to, to reduce um, rampant growth of cells or of this plaque. And so, yes, let's take a look how exactly the stents are used for a very simple um, example. On the left side, you can see this ballon catheters which are used to Im implant the stent. So, um, it's a very it's a very small tube you can see here most less than one millimeter sometimes and then you put the stand which you can see out on the outside on the tube and then you have like a pump a manual pump which you cannot see on the picture right now and by uh, pumping you increase the the air pressure inside this tube and therefore uh, the tube itself starts to uh, inflate and that will also open the stand and what you're doing during uh, the therapy in the end is and that's a good thing about stands you don't have to open the hole let's say for example if you want to use the stand in the heart uh, heart blood vessel you don't have to open like the whole chest anymore it's a so-called uh, minimum invasive therapy you just need a very small a small cut so that you can get access to the to the uh, vessel you want to infla uh, inflate, and then through this small hole you can insert the deflated balloon catheter, including the stand, and then you push the stand with the help, for example, of X-ray device exactly at the position you want the stand to be, and then you can start to expand the stand. And what will ha ha uh, happen in the end is that this um, the stand will become bigger. Uh, and when it reaches its final size, it will also like remove the plaque mechanically, and then it will stay in this inflated um, state. You can then uh, remove uh, um, the pressure from the catheter and then throw it back. And then the inflated stand will remain exactly where you want in the vessel. And I mean, that really sounds smart, it's a really great thing and really helped to improve um, um, the life quality of people who suffered under arteriosclerosis. But um, if we think about it, there's something which is a little bit maybe strange because on the one hand, uh, uh, you know, inflating this this tube here will also inflate the, it makes sense, will also inflate the, sta uh, the stand. But what is a little bit strange, I mean, when we want to remove uh, this balloon catheter, we just uh, release the pressure. But instead, uh, in contrast to the um, balloon, the stand remain in his uh, in a state. And the reason for that is um, related to stress and deformation. And this is, uh, let's say, one of the main design parameters when we're talking about designing stands. So let's take a look at it. Um, last time I asked, uh, what is your professional background? And it seems like most of you were engineers, biomedical engineers, or, or uh, natural scientists. So maybe some of you already know what stress is and what kinds of deformations we have. But for those who never heard about it, I think it would make sense to talk about it quickly. Okay, so the question was, why can we, or why does the stand stay in the configuration, in this inflated configuration, even after we remove um, the balloon? And the reason, as I mentioned, uh, is, is, is the way of deformation. 
And now let's take a look at a very easy example that will really help you to understand what is the idea in the end when it comes to design a stand. Uh, here you can see a, a, a kind of, of experimental machine, which is you will find in, I would say, every university where mechanical engineering is teached. And uh, what this machine basically do, do, does is that um, you can put the sample material here inside and you have a top and a lower wise. And then this top and lower wise, they start to move away from each other and will tension then this material sample. And what this machine also does, it's uh, the machine is also um, like recording um, the stress and the strain which is applied therefore to this problem. Just to explain it, strain in the end is like the elongation of a material. So when the two vices move uh, away from each other uh, and they are like f f connected to the probe the length of the probe of the sample will change, which we call strain. So the strain is a relative change of length of the sample material. And stress, we say stress is force per, per area, uh, is in the end the force we need to, to move these two vices away from each other, divided by the um, by the cross-section of the sample is the stress. So what we do in the end, we are increasing the, the strain step by step and just looking how stress is changing. And if you would do it like for any, let's say, standard um, uh, uh, metallic sample, like just steel, a steel sample, we could see such a curve. And the first part of a curve is linear. Then you have like a, here it's like going a little bit up and down, and then it's like a curve reaching a maximum, going down and stop. And here where it stops, uh, what will happen here is that we will destroy our sample material, so we will uh, cause a fracture. And now let's just think, why does I have this kind of curve every time? The reason is we have two kinds of deformation. We have a so-called linear and a non-linear part. And now let's take a deeper look at that. In this area, the stress somehow is proportional to the strain. And when we, in the end, would devise rise by run of this um, of this uh, uh, linear part, we would get a, a constant which we call our Young's module. And this is very important uh, because if you can remember, we used back last back then last week we used this material property, the Young's module, to describe um, the material property of our hip joint prosthesis. And it, now it's a funny thing. If I would like um, uh, increase the strain of this probe. As long as I'm in this this area, in this uh, linear area, as uh, at the moment I will remove the force and the stress, this probe will go back in its initial state. So, um, for example, if it's looking like this at this point, let's call it A. And here at B, it's like this. And if we now would go back to C, to this standard point, it would again look exactly the same. And this is called uh, elastic deformation. And it basically means that as long as you're in this, uh, uh, let's say, area of elastic deformation, it's not a, a, a staying deformation. As soon as you remove the forces acting on the material, it will go back to its initial state. And that is, for example, what is happening with this balloon inside of the stand. But if we now increase the strain more and more, we go. Uh, it's not any more linear, 
it's not we call it nonlinear. And nonlinear, you know, is a big word because everything which is not linear is nonlinear. But what you can see here is very important because we can again divide the section to to subsections. And in this one part, you can see strain hardening. What does this mean? If we would increase the strain more and more, it would go a little back down and then again up. And what is happening here, we are leaving this elastic area, this elastic deformation and go into a plastic deformation. And plastic deformation means that even if we move the forces, a part of deformation will change. So we will have a permanent deformation. And this is what we call plastic deformation. And now if you think about it, and you can see so two areas in this plastic deformation. It starts to, the, the, the stress first increases more and more, and then we have like a, a maximum and then it goes down. This first part from the, let's say, end of the elastic elongation or deformation to the um, end of, or to this maximum, is where we uh, so-called strain hardening is happening because the reason why it's not any more elastic is that you have permanent changes to the crystal structure, for example, of the material. And in this area, increasing the, st uh, the, uh, the strain will make your material, let's say, harder. So it will uh, uh, not change anymore it's, it's, uh, 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 how it's looking, even if you remove the force, but it will become harder and harder. But, and if you then still increase strain and have higher stresses, then it starts to have a negative impact and necking starts. In the end, uh, you have this fracture. And so when we design a, a stand, our idea is that inflating the stand will exactly bring us in this area here so that we have a, 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 a permanent, um, a, um, a, a permanent um, deformation of the stand, and also we want to have a kind of hardening to have a higher stiffness, stiffness of the stand. And so when it comes to design a stand, our aim is that at the final stage of inflation, we are here in, this, in the start of the strain hardening area, so that we have a plastic deformation but it's not and, and hardening, but it's not too much strain because we don't want to have necking. By the way, guys, if you have question-related suggestions, just write them into our question box and I will answer them. And there is already a first first um, uh, already some first questions I would like to answer first question is by vanilla and he wants to know why can't we use both types together is it possible and I think you are talking about this uh, let's go back to the slide maybe about these two types we had the uh, the bare metal stand and the drug electing stand right Yes, and um, you can use them together. Basically, you know, every drug electing stand is based on a bar metal stand. But you have to choose if you want to, to uh, apply a drug coat on the stand or not. So the only difference between these two types of stand is that one of them has additional uh, drug coating and the other not. So I hope that's clear. And there is a... Uh, um, then there is a uh, next question by Nivita, and uh, 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 the question is if stands can harm our muscles. And basically, to be honest, I don't know if stand would harm our muscle. I think if you would insert the metal part into your muscle that it would harm your muscle, but um, you know the way the stands are inserted, they're not in touch with the muscle. So you are like creating a small opening in the skin with the near of the vessel, and then you can put it directly into the vessel. Okay, uh, and then um, there was a next question by Tech Sinchung. What does yield strength actually mean? Why would a stress go down here when we elongate further? Okay, yes, that's also a good question. Let's answer this question based on the slide. I think that will make things easier. Um, and um, but before I answer your question, there's a sec second question by um, um, also related to this. 
um, by Anva how we can maintain uniform force in the balloon. Let's maybe talk about first about this question, then I will talk about what yield stresses. Okay, Anwar, um, I think you answered your question a little bit yourself. The reason why we are using the balloon is that inside the balloon we will have a uniform pressure distribution. And since the balloon is also ch uh, changing his volume with increasing pressure, that will help to have in the end a kind of uniform force distribution. For sure, it will not be absolutely uniform, but that's a good compromise to 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 um, to find. Okay, and now let's go back to the question uh, related to the yield stress and um, take a look exactly what's happening here in the graph. Um, this area, this transition area between um, linear and non-linear behavior, there you have this yield stress. And what is basically happening, to put it in, in, in simple words, as you know, metal material is made of atoms and they are organized in a kind of, of, of grid. And when you leave this, this, this elastic uh, uh, deformation area, at the beginning, the first, let's say, parts in the or the first structures in this grid get damaged and that will very for just a, for the little bit strain it will on, on the first view increase the strength of your material but once this first let's say connections in the grid are cracked your your stress goes down and that's what we call the yield strand so because in this area it's like the transition between linear and non-linear behavior and there is uh, some other questions, so let's go through them. Um, yes, and there was uh, Anwar uh, also asked something. Uh, uh, if the uh, force is really uniform through the whole process of stand inflation, and for sure not. So this is just a simplification because in reality we have three-dimensional stress states in a three-dimensional device. But I think, well, I hope that, that this example still helps you to understand what is what is the main challenge when designing a stand. And um, then uh, I would say it's because you're writing a lot of questions. Let maybe answer some questions later because as I think some of them will also clear out when we do um, the live demonstration. Okay, guys. And there is just one thing which is very important because, I mean, it's, 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 uh, if you have uh, an, an arteriosclerosis and you, for example, apply a stand, that will definitely help. But for some reasons, sometimes there are some effects which can really also cause damage after the treatment with the stand. And what I'm meaning is restenosis. Restenosis, in the end, is describing overshooting reproduction of cells in the blood vessel. And to understand this, I take a look at this graph. They show different states uh, of a, a, a articlosorus of a vessel. So first, you have this healthy vessel. Then image B here shows um, if you have uh, um, arteriosclerosis. And then an image C, what you can see, um, just take the pen, what you can see also here, you have um, in, that, in that stand here. And if everything goes well, the stand will keep the vessel open, but what can happen for some reason is that you have, as I mentioned, a rampant growth of cells, and this cells can then grow through the stand and renewing the vessel. And this is something you really want to avoid. And for this, you can, for, first of all, you can use drugs uh, and medical therapy to make sure that there will be no rampant growth of cells in this in this vessel, but also designing the stand can have an impact on how this restenosis will happen or if it will happen at all or not. And yes, this is also very important to understand. Okay, guys, great. I think you know us, know everything you need to know about and stands, and we can right now start to set up the simulation. And 
let's take a, a look at the stand first of all. And what we will do today, we will simulate the process of inflating a stand in the blood vessel. So we will really simulate how the uh, balloon catheter is blowing up our stand. And first of all, before we start to set up simulation, let's make some primary results. Because as you know, our stand is a round device. And if we just take a look, on the left side, what you can see here, let's assume this blue thing is our stand. And inside we have the balloon. And as I mentioned, by increasing the pressure inside of this balloon, we are applying a normal force on the wall of this balloon, which is red. And this will result in a nearly uniform distribution of force around the whole stand. And what you can see directly, this is a symmetrical problem. Why? It's symmetric because, first of all, the geometry is symmetric. The load is symmetric too. And therefore, we don't have to simulate the whole stand, but we can simulate a part of the stand instead. And this is what we want to do today. Instead of simulating the whole stand, we will just simulate a 60 degree a part of the stand. Why 60 degree? If you take a look at the stand geometry, what we will do in the next, next minutes, you will see that this is the smallest angle you can need to have a full representation of the geometry of the stand. And the big advantage is of using the symmetrical model that it will reduce massively the, the computational power we need and therefore we will receive the result faster. Okay, and here you can see uh, what kind of stand we will simulate. So this is this, this, this symmetrical part. And in the end what we will do is that we will apply symmetry here, here and here. And we will have also symmetry in the end on the lower surfaces. We will fix one side here and apply the force on this inner surfaces here. And then we have our simulation model which we want to, to use. Okay, then let's take a look at what we will do today. We will, first of all, as you know, we will import the geometry of the stand, which is already simplified, so it's only um, only the part of the symmetric part of the stand we want to simulate later on. We will create a mesh, so we will divide the stand into smaller subdomains uh, where we want to investigate exactly the distribution of stress and forces and displacement. After that, we will set up the simulation, so we will describe how this stand is interacting with this geometry uh, environment, that means how it's interacting with the balloon but also with the vessels and, and, and uh, with the coordinate system. And finally, we will uh, analyze the results and do post-processing. And I would say let's directly start. So um, I have prepared something, hope you can see it. Um, so. This is a project including the geometry of the stand and later on I will share this geometry with you. So you can, as part of your homework, perform the simulation yourself. And now if you open the platform, you can directly see our geometry. So. Here we have two CAD models inside of the project and we will first take a look at the first one. It's a stand and so let's maybe take a look. As you can see it's really like dividing a cake and this is one slice of 60 degree through the whole stand. And first of all we have to create a mesh. And for those of you who maybe not joined last week and didn't have the chance uh, right now uh, already to watch the recording, um, in the end what we are doing, and this is very important uh, to keep it in your mind, what we are doing when performing a structural simulation is that 
we are like using um, equations which we have to solve and these equations will give us for every point in the material uh, the physical quantities. But since we are using numerical method and working on computers, we are limited by the number of, of points because our memory is limited and therefore you have to define yourself first where you want how much local uh, accuracy. And what we're doing for that is dividing this geometry in a lot of small subgeometries, a lot of small tetrahedral cells. And for every of the cells, then we will calculate stress, strain, etc. So it's like our, let's say, virtual resolution, our, our local uh, spatial resolution of our simulation. And this is the first step we have to perform. So we will click on create a new mesh. Then we first of all have to choose some geometry we want to match. We want to use stand model one. We have to save it. And then this new mesh uh, is added to your project tree on the left side. Next, we have to add the meshed operation. And here you can see we have different operations for different applications. Last week we used the automatic tetrahedral measure and this week we use the parametric tetrahedral measure. The difference is if you take a look we have some more settings for the parametric. Uh, using the parametric will allow us to define maximum minimal edge length ourselves while using the tetrahedral automatic measure will do everything automated. And okay let's start. Since the stand is quite small we also need some quite small cells so the maximum um, element or mesh edge length will therefore be 0.0004 meters which is uh, 400 still of a millimeter and the maximum size will be a little bit a minimum size a little bit smaller then we will use a so-called second order mesh what this means will be discussed in right now but this is very important to use a second order mesh instead of a first order mesh. So let's take a look what it means. Um, as you know, we are dividing our geometry into small tetrahedral elements. And last week we, we performed a simulation of a prosthesis. And as you can imagine, we said that we are only in this linear deformation uh, uh, and therefore we use so-called first order elements. What's the difference? Here you can see both elements. On the left side the first order, on the right side the second order. The first order elements and the second order elements are both tetrahedral. But in addition, the second order elements have an additional node on every edge. And this node allows to have uh, also to um, capture uh, if for example the, the, the cell is changing because when you have deformation the cell will deformate and this allows the element to deform better and will uh, allow us to have a higher resolution with the same number of elements compared to a first order mesh. And when it comes to high deformations, this is very important. That's the reason why we used the first order mesh last week, because we weren't accepting big deformations. Uh, and in contrast, this week we want to investigate plastic deformation of a stand and therefore using second order elements is better. And, and this image also shows why. So this is uh, the same simulation with the first order and second order element mesh. And you, what you can see here is um, the first order mesh, you have like a, it's so a little bit rough here because this, you have only, you have no uh, nodes on the edges. While a second order mesh, the result is much smoother because the edges of the elements can adapt. And so that's the reason why we are using the second order mesh which comes with some disadvantages. It needs more, more, more memory, it needs more time to compute, but it will help us to achieve better results. Next is we have to define a fineness parameter which is controlling the overall fineness. So this is just like saying how much uh, or how fine or coarse you want to have your mesh based on the minimum maximum edge length. And here we will use the option 3, moderate. We will activate the net Gen 3D optimization, which is an automatic optimization of the mesh, and we will use eight, uh, four cores, so four CPUs, to calculate the mesh. 
click on save and the only thing we have to do right now is press the start button and then our mesh will be automatically calculated in the cloud. So let's do a quick wrap up. I just showed you um, yes, how to create a mesh. We talked about the parametric tetrahedral mesher and especially there we talked about the influence of first and second order meshing. Uh, you know that for so simulations where you have a lot of plastic deformation, uh, second order is better than first order and once our mesh is finished we can um, resume with the actual simulation setup. So. Um, let's change back and I've already prepared something which will make um, our work or our webinar a little bit easier today. Uh, I've already created a project including the mesh. Let, let me open it and then we don't have to wait until the computation of our mesh is finished because as you can see right now, oh and it's already finished so this was pretty fast nice and here you can see the mesh of the stand. We can for example also take a look inside by applying this mesh clip filter. For example let's do it in Y direction And now we can take here a look inside the mesh and you can see for example how the mesh was automatically refined here for example or here. Great, now we will switch to the simulation designer and set up our simulation. First of all we will create a new simulation. Just call it simulation one in this case and then we have to select as you know first of all the analyzers type we want to perform. And we want to perform a static analysis advanced but this time we want to perform a nonlinear analysis so we change this to true. This will allow, allow us um, to um, feature nonlinearity and especially this large deformations. Click on save and everything you need for the simulation will be automatically added to the simulation um, uh, pro, uh, um, project tree on the left side. And first of all we have to choose the mesh we want to simulate. So click on the mesh, click on save and the mesh will be added to your workspace. And before we resume, uh, presume with, with setting up the simulation, first of all we create so-called topological entity sets. Topological entity sets uh, help you by grouping surfaces, volume, edges or nodes into groups and then you can, if you manage the whole group for example, uh, it, it can help for example when you want to define boundary condition you don't have to select all the faces again and again. So we will change our representation to surface, it will make uh, the selection of the faces easier and start to create our face sets. And first of all, let's start with our cyclic boundaries which meet for our symmetry and select this three outer faces and this faces and this lower faces, they will be used for defining the symmetry later on. So let's create the first set and I will call it cyclic master faces. For the three faces on the other side, I will create a group called cyclic slave faces. And you may ask yourself why I'm calling them master and slave. The reason is we will for defining this uh, uh, symmetry later on, not using a boundary condition, but contacts instead. And then we have to apply master and slave. But in this case, it really makes no difference if which or what of them is master, which one of them is slave. Okay, two things are missing. First of all, we have a kind of symmetry and uh, here, because 
this is you know the outer side of the stand and this inner side we also use a second symmetry so we have two symmetries in the end because uh, we have the symmetry in radial direction and we have the symmetry in y direction so we will create here also a symmetry call it y symmetry and finally we will create a uh, face head for this face because here we will apply later on the balloon pressure. Great, so we have created now four face sets, uh, topological entity sets, which we will use later on. And the next thing, as I mentioned, we have to define one contact. And this um, contact is necessary in reason to have this uh, cyclic symmetry. And we have a dedicated type for this called cyclic symmetry. Let's first of all change the name. And here you can see three properties you have to define. First is axis origin, second is axis direction, third is angle. And some of you may hear about the right thumb rule. The right thumb rule is used, for example, for in physics for understanding the interaction between a magnet and the electrical field. And um, we can use this right thumb rule also to define the symmetry. So and so what you have in the end to understand is that you are defining here a vector in the end which is showing the direction of your symmetry and you're giving an angle. And so we will keep our origin 0, 0, 0 and just change the direction and we will change it to 0, 1, 0 which means our axis is in this direction, y direction. And this is also exactly the rotation axis, as you can see here. It's in y direction. And the right hand rule means that if you use now your right hand and show with your right thumb of your right hand in this y direction, your other fingers will show you the rotation direction you're referring to. And in our case, we have a 60 degree uh, sector. And now this information will help some scale and will automatically add the symmetrical boundary conditions you need. So this is done. Finally we have to assign it on a face and we have to choose the master, the slave, then we can save it and even take a look at our assignment. And so our first symmetrical relation is defined for the cyclic symmetry. And next is an option we have to change. Therefore, we switch to, to the smash uh, uh, item, and there is a sub-item called 3D. And there you can add element technology definitions. And there is just one thing we will change. We will change global settings from standard to reduced interaction. And this menu is about how your mesh is treated during the simulation. And reduced integration is, helps uh, to, to have good results uh, for second order meshes. So whenever you use a second order mesh, I would also recommend to reduce this reduced integration instead of the standard setting. Just click on save and everything is applied. Right, and now we are at the final stage. The only things we have to define are our boundary conditions and the material. So let's resume. First of all, now we have to define the material model for our stand. And for this simulation we will use a material model of 360LN, it's a stainless steel which was used before in medical, uh, medical science. And we have a plastic material behavior. Last time we used line linear elastic only. Plastic means we have plastic deformations. And then we have to define the material parameters. First of all, I will enter this Young's module, which I found uh, in literature. You have also to add the point. Let's maybe just take a look back on the slide. It will make some things easier. So to describe our material, now, uh, we have to add, first of all, the Young's module. So uh, the, the proportional coefficient for this il uh, elastic deformation. The next thing we are asked to provide is the uh, Poisson ratio. And this Poisson ratio describes in the end the compression of, of or elongation uh, of a material 
uh, and how it can be split up into a trans reverse and an axial part. So you can change it therefore from 0 0.5 to 1. And we use 0 0.3, which means that it's compressible. And this is the material value which you can find in literature. Final thing we are asked to add is a table. And you will ask yourself a table, why? Well, as you know, <laughs> this part here, from here, is not, uh, so this is this, this, uh, non non um, uh, uh, linear part of the plastic deformation, cannot be described anymore with a young, young modulus, for example. So since it's not uh, uh, linear, you need really a, a, a table or which is describing how this curve is behaving. And therefore, we also need a value table, which I have prepared already. So we can maybe take a look at this. Let me open it. And um, just need one second, sorry. Exactly here. So this is the file. Uh, we will provide it with you also later on. And in the end, x is strain, y is stress. You can see our it's, it's uh, separated by a comma. And so you can create these files your own and can even choose how you want to separate them. So we won't use the CSV file. So let's call it 360ln. and choose this file, click on Upload, and then maybe let me just explain what this settings means. You see, strain is column one, because and stress is column two, so this is right. And we start to count from one. If you would change strain and stress in this table, you also have to change one and two here. And then he can just choose how you want to interpolate between the values. And since uh, uh, it's, it's linear data, we want to use linear interpolation. And that's basically it. Then you also ask if you want to have creep. We don't want to have creep. And we have to enter finally the density, which is a little bit different than standard steel, and add it to a material. And now we are done. And if you want to change the material property of the stand design, you have just to change these this values. And yes, the next step is to define the so-called boundary conditions. As you know, we have initial conditions and boundary conditions. Initial conditions are used as the initial state for our iterative calculation. We don't have to touch them in this case, they are fine. And boundary conditions are describing, in the end, how our model is interacting with the environment. And here we need two kind of constraints, boundary conditions. So let's start with the first one. I call it x restriction. It's a fixed value. And this um, x restriction just means that the faces can't move in x direction. So um, x displacement is uh, prescribed, while y and z displacement are unconstrained. And we will apply this on our face sets we already have to the cyclic master faces. Save. And this means that these faces cannot move in x direction. Why do we need do we need this boundary condition? Uh, if we would not add it, it would mean that this our part would rotate around its own axis. And so this is necessary to to make sure our symmetry is treated the right way. But we also need a restriction in y direction because we don't want to the stand move at all. And we call it y symmetry. It's um, again a fixed value, and in this case, um, y displacement is unconstrained. No, sorry. In this case, um, y dis, uh, is uh, prescribed, 
y, x, and z uh, displacement on constraint. And we map it on our face set y symmetry, which means, if you think about it, this surface can only move um, in, in x or y direction, but not in z direction. And finally, we need a load, the load of our balloon. So create a new boundary condition. He will choose type pressure. And instead of giving a fixed value, we will enter a formula. and apply it on the balloon pressure uh, 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 entity set. What basically means that uh, time-dependent pressure, because we want to just, just investigate different steps of this inflation, will be applied on the surface. Great, now we kneel it down. The only thing we have to modify are the numerics. So you can see we have different equation solvers which are used to solve finally the linear equation system. And standard is multifront, it's a direct solver. It's therefore easy to set up and behaves for easy problem very well and very fast. But if we have uh, really this, this large deformations, we need something which is more stable and they will use MUMPS. Okay, next thing is uh, we are asked for um, the nonlinear resolution type, for example, and the convergence criteria. So, first of all, what we will change is um, we will have a relative uh, convergence criteria and change it. Make it, we don't need such a precision. And finally, we will change li uh, line search to true, which will help to manage this larger deformations. And now the final step is so-called result control and simulation control. So here, we will change the simulation interval. So we want to simulate one second in time. It's a pseudo time, not the real physical time. With a time length of 0.05, that means we will have 20 steps. We will use eight cores instead of only four. And we want to uh, increase the maximum runtime to make sure simulation will not be stopped automatically. And finally, we will delete the Cauchy stress from the solution field. So in this option, solutions field, you can define what will be calculated. We don't need the Cauchy stress, so we will remove it to save uh, uh, memory and, and storage. But we will add something else. And uh, we will add um, volume calculation. volume stress and calculate automatically minimum and maximum von Mises stress for the whole part. Well, we are done. Finally, we check our simulation, create a new run, and then we can basically start the simulation. And now our simulation will be calculated in the cloud and we will get a notification as soon as the calculation is finished. Okay, then let's make a quick wrap up. We discussed about general setup of the simulation, so I showed you which analysis type you need. In this case, it was um, uh, with uh, st uh, static analysis with uh, uh, advanced nonlinearity. I showed you how to assign the mesh and create topological intercepts in order to reduce the work for later boundary condition setup. 
we talked about contacts and the different symmetries we used for this model, defined this plastic material using additional laser stress uh, strain table, and uh, also showed you how to define boundary conditions and start the simulation. And for sure, there are some advanced topics we have not talked about today. So there are a lot of advanced stuff you can do with the result control. You can add your own res uh, result fields and stuff like that. And it's also possible to modificate the numerical settings in order to achieve a better and quicker result. But for the first step, this is really great what we've done so far. And since creating the simulation takes a little bit longer than the mesh. I've already created a project including the finished simulation and so let's take a look at that. So here you can see I have two different simulations but this is the one we're interested in. Let's go to the post processor. And first of all, this is a simulation we made right now. And after 33 minutes, the simulation is finished. You can see the residual plot here, and then you can switch to the post processor and take a look at the results in 3D. And now we are going to load the 3D post processing environment in order to perform the result analysis in our web browser. And guys, uh, you should really keep in mind everything we're doing here is performed in the cloud live. So, yes. By default, the, the, the final simulation time step is loaded. And what we can see here is this stand with the stress. And first thing we want to do is now to add a so-called wrapper vector filter to visualize the displacement. You can see what this filter is doing basically. It scales the geometry based on the displacement vector with a scale factor of 1. So this is real the displacement, how the stand looks at the final uh, stage of uh, inflation. And if we now, for example, click on this play button, we really get a kind of animation showing us how the stand is inflating. And since it's hard to imagine symmetries yourself, especially for such complex models, uh, we have a kind of trick. We will hide the initial run, click on this wrap by vector filter and add the transform filter, you know from last time. And last time we used the transform filter to, yes, to transform different simulations in one coordinate system to be able to analyze them in the same window. Right now we will use it to resolve all symmetry. So we will add a rotation of 60 degree to y-axis. And as you can see, this will add the missing part. And we can do this again and again. We need at least five of these transform filters to have the full geometry. One is missing. And these filters, you know, are organized uh, not in parallel, which means that this filter is, is rotating by 60 degree. Then this one is again rotating by 60 degree. and so on and so on and that helps us finally to have the full stand there. Two steps are missing here. And finally here. And now, as you can see, we have our full stand. And now let's go back. This is how the stand looks at the beginning. And now let's just start the animation. And now we are increasing the pressure of the balloon step by step. And you can see now it's starting to inflate.
Yes, and you can really see how it's working. There's for sure one thing you should keep in mind, there is still half of the model missing. So basically you would have here also a symmetry. So this is just the half of the stand. Yes, and what can we see here? I mean basically if I turn on this is how the stand looked initially and after blowing it up. And for example here you now can see the stress. And just for example, this yield stress of this metal is around 250 megapascal, which we've reached already here. So I would say everything here has a state of plastic deformation, which is quite good. And you can, for example, also take a look at the total nonlinear strain. which is um, not very big. Let's just take a look at this one small part. Here. And here you can see that in all these areas we have just small nonlinear strains, so uh, a lot of nonlinear strains, sorry. So here everything where you can see it's maybe let's change representation from zero to zero point seven. You can see that everywhere where it's blue, light blue, you have really plastic def uh, deformation and that will keep the this, this, this stand in his in his um, uh, how it is after inflating. You can also do other things for example if you want to take a look inside you can for sure create a slice, for example, if we want to take, for example, here a look inside, add a slice. And what we can also do for sure is to compare different stands. Let me first create maybe my slice. in y direction. And for example, right now what you can see here is the slice through this part. Let me maybe hide everything else. And then you can take a look even inside of the structure of the stand here. Great. What you can also do, by the way, is to compare stands. Uh, it's described in the tutorial how you can do it because um, you will not only perform one stand simulation. And for example, what I've done, I want to show you, I use exactly the same stand geometry and change the material from steel to a, a cobalt chrome alloy. And then you can, yes, just compare them. As you can see, I added both results to the viewer, performed the same steps, and now I just start the uh, animation. And then you will see after some seconds how the different stands are developing. Here, exactly. So here you can see the two different stands. We have inner and outer stand. Let 
let's jump to the latest step. And then you can see one is uh, um, opening much more than the other and also has a different kind of shape. Great guys. Okay. So I think we also talked a little bit about post-processing. I showed you how to use the Rabbi Vector filter, how to change the time steps, and to use the transform filter and slices in order to get insights into uh, the stand. Um, again, there are some things we cannot talk about today. For example, derivation of additional physical quantities, what is theoretically possible. So if you're doing a study and you want, for example, a dedicated kind of stress, you can just calculate it yourself using the calculation filter. And for sure, we could do such more process processing with plots, uh, DI diagrams, etc. But for this, we would need local post processing, and therefore, it's not shown during the tutorial. But I think what you've learned so far is much enough to to create own simulations to perform post processing on your own. And if you have questions, you can use our forum. Great. Now I would just like to introduce your um, homework assignment to you, and after that we will have time for your questions and your answers and my answers. So let's make it crisp. This will be your homework for this week. Your job will be to test two different types of cardiovascular stance models, and you can see them in the picture below. So we have this one design, which we simulated right now. By the way, just to make it clear, we just took this part of the geometry and the rest was modeled with symmetries and the next job of you is to do the same for this kind of stand so you will have two different two meshes for both stands and for every mesh at least two simulations that means you will have four simulation ones because you will simulate uh, both stands with uh, these two materials i talked talked about um, with the steel and this cobalt chrome alloy. And for sure, we again prepared homework resources you will find, first of all, on simscale.com slash biomedical workshop. And here right now, you can already find the tutorial. We will add in the next couple of hours, I think latest uh, tomorrow, the recording of the workshop. And here you find some, some in, uh, information material about uh, stand implementation and then a detailed step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial how to set up the simulation. And if in the case you need help, just write into this forum topic and we will do our best. And yes, that's it. So thank you very much uh, for attending the second session. And now, uh, if you have questions, just write them and I will try my best to answer them all. Okay, and I already have a first question by... Um, First question is by uh, Kirsana. He wants to know if drug or a drug on drug electing stands lead to caution of or rusting of the stand. And no, the stands are made in a way that they cannot rust or, or get uh, corrosion. And the drugs are really used to to um, avoid, um, you know, overshooting grow of cells. Next question is by Andan Kuma. He wants to know why uh, we are using balloon cassida and if there are any other. Yes, for sure, there are other cassidas which are used for other applications, but when it comes to stands, as far as I know, only balloon cassida are used because they give you full control and allow you to, to put the stand exactly there where you want it to be. Um, there's a question of um, which is asking how we can say that the load is symmetry, that blood flow may be laminar and sometimes turbulent. Yes, and that's definitely right, but you should not forget that, and uh, maybe let's go back, we are not simulating the force of the blood going through this uh, vessel, but we are simulating the pressure applied by the balloon, and this is symmetric. 
Then Thomas wants to know what the comparison between a second order mesh and a first order mesh with the uh, half the element size. Um, that's a good question. I think what you mean is you use a second order mesh and a first order mesh with the double time of elements, right? And what would be the difference between the results? That's basically a good question, Thomas, and it will depend on the simulation, on your boundary conditions, and also on the mesh quality. But um, as I described, using the second order mesh, we will have this additional nodes. And therefore, I would say, depending on the case, if because if you take a look, if you would replace this tetrahedral element by more tetrahedrals, then you would have the same effect. You would have additional nodes on this edge. And I think uh, there might be the same uh, effect where higher element number for first order mesh can help you to reduce the problems, but really when it comes to big deformations, it's not only the number of edges, there, there are other reasons and therefore I would use second order meshes all the time. Um, then Thomas wants to know why do we create topological entity sets for applying boundary conditions like pressure rather than to apply boundary conditions to geometrical phase. Thomas, that's a good question. And basically that's just a question of flavor. I like to show it to you because in, you know, the aim is that later on you can use some scale yourself to create your own simulations. And there will, might be the case that the geometry is not so easy and then this uh, topological entity sets will help you and make your work easier. But at any point you can also, instead of using the face set, use directly the face. Okay, um, Christopher wants to know if we recommend to reduce integration for linear problems or just nonlinear problems. As far as I know, I would just use it for nonlinear problems because in the end, it's helping you, you know, to um, have a better treatment of these big deformations. Um, then there is a question. Uh, Alexander wants to know, but since stress drops during necking, how do we know we aren't necking? That's a good question, Alexander. And for this, that was the reason why we took a look or why we uh, were um, also investigating maximum and minimum stress in the stand, because this helps us to get an idea about what is exactly happening inside. Then there is a question by um, Aristide Miga Prativi. He wants to know if we can use hexahedral meshes instead of tetrahedral mesh in this case. Unfortunately, that's not possible. If you take a look at the mesher, um, you can also see that the mesh operations of hex dominant are also called only for CFD. And you can use them only for fluid flow simulations, what I'll show you to you next week. So for for um, this uh, 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 structural simulations, you have to use tetrahedral elements. Um, then there is a question by Anver: What's about the blood pressure after the stand integration led to the feather uh, deformation? Um, that's a good question, and I mean that's the aim by the end. This will reduce your blood pressure because you have now a bigger diameter. Okay, I think I've asked most of the questions. There are some more questions. For example, um, one was regarding line search. What is line search exactly doing? And by the way, in general, um, you can use um, uh, also our help center to get ideas about what something is doing. And for example, if you go on line search, you'll directly get information um, and here it's exactly described what it's doing and it's uh, in the end it's uh, helping to improve convergence of nonlinear calculations because it helps to look for lines, edges and uh, yes improves therefore the convergence. Okay, are there any more questions or any question I forget to answer just write it. Okay, uh, Nivisa Niki wants to know if we should change the shape of the stands. 
no, you don't have to change uh, uh, the uh, geometry of the stands. As I mentioned, you, we will provide you with a project including both uh, geometries and you just have to change the material parameters. But in general, whenever you want to modify something, do it and we will be happy to help you. So if you have the idea for designing your own stand, just do it, upload it and try to use uh, uh, the tutorial for the, your own geometry. And um, in the end, only your uh, imagination is, is, is lim the limiting factor here, since we're doing simulations. Great. Since there are no questions anymore. I would like to thank you all for joining the session. It was a big pleasure, big pleasure for me. Uh, I will send you an email tomorrow including all resources you need for the homework. In the case you have not finished your homework, you have still some hours, so keep pushing and qualify for a free professional training. Next week we will do our first computational fluid dynamics simulation. So we will simulate the flow through such a, 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 a blood vessel with uh, arterial clerosis. So hope to see you next week. Have a nice weekend. See you soon. Bye.